normal. All right, the chamber pressure looks good. Time right now. Water towers fly! Yes! Ego down to nominal. Water down to your feet off. Bring it, let's see off. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. What's up, everybody? Whatever time of day it is for you, nighttime, daytime, morning, evening, midday, welcome to another NASA Spaceflight live stream. You are currently looking at a Falcon 9 rocket carrying a cargo dragon capsule at launch pad 39A Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We are going to be live streaming this launch, or maybe scrub, dare I say, uh, <laughs> tonight for you guys, and I. As always, am joined by some of our members in the field. First up, we've got Julia Bergeron out there. What What are you thinking, Julia? How's the weather look? Well, um, to be honest, what I'm thinking is this was sleeping weather when I woke up. And <laughs> it is not raining right now, but the ceiling yeah. is really low. Noted. All right, well, we'll just have to cross our fingers and pray to the launch gods. Next up, out there in the field, not on comms, but uh, operating the camera that you are seeing right now is Stephen Marr. So thank you, Stephen, for being out there and operating the camera for us. So we have a live feed. And Stephen Marr is at Space Coast Steve on Twitter. So be sure to give him a follow. He always posts excellent photos and whatnot. And, of course, we're also joined by Thomas Berghardt, News Director for NASA Space Flight. What's up, Thomas? How's it going, Jack? No complaints. What do you think about the weather, Thomas? How, do you, how are you feeling about our chances tonight? I see, well, I see the, the chances of launch weather being green are, I think, what, 30%? That yeah. was the pre-launch forecast from the 45th Weather Squadron, a 30% chance of acceptable weather. Um, lots of weather concerns regarding a couple of different weather rules, the cumulus cloud rule, the thick, thick cloud layer rule, and the surface electric field rules were the concerns listed in the actual weather report leading up to today's launch, and that was all pertained to that cloud ceiling and the storms that were in the Kennedy Space Center area leading up to the launch. Um, right now, we're just under 49 minutes from our T0, which is 5.07 a.m. Eastern Time, 10.07 UTC, and uh, I, the, the big question is going to be, do they get a go for propellant load to give it a launch attempt for that T0, which we'll get... Uh, right around T minus 38 minutes is when that go no go is given for propellant load, because as we all know, Falcon 9 fueling starts at 35 minutes before launch. Um, same fueling countdown as normal, so that's going to be the next decision point where we see is the weather close enough that you can give this a launch attempt. Excellent. Well, we'll just have to wait about 10 minutes and find out how that goes. Also, last but definitely not least. We have the stream operating machine that I'm pretty sure is human. Uh, Michael in the background operating the stream. Thank you, Michael, for this stream and so many of our others lately and always. We very much appreciate it. No problem. Ooh, the rare Michael on comms. <laughs> Excellent. So don't forget, everybody, this is a interactive sort of stream like all of our streams. If you have any questions, throw them into chat there. You can put at NASA Spaceflight and then ask your question, and that way uh, your question will pop up in some software that, sure enough, Michael wrote. So I am currently looking for some questions for us here. And here's a good one right off the bat. This is a brand new booster. Booster 1069. Yes, it is. First first flight for this booster, and uh, the newest booster now entering the fleet. Uh, previously, that was held by 1067, which recently completed its third flight. But uh, a first flight for the first time in a while, and uh, of course 1069 will be recovered after this flight, hopefully, with a landing on Just Read the Instructions, Station Downrange. Uh, that is our drone ship recovery plan for CRS-24. And uh, hopefully the first of many flights for this brand new Falcon 9 booster. 
So we have a question pertaining to that. Niche Ant is asking, why a new booster? I mean, you have to fly a new booster for the first time sometime, right? Right, yeah. It's not any specific mission requirement or anything. As we know, NASA has flown many missions on reused boosters, including cargo missions, including crewed missions, and like uncrewed probes and satellites and things like that. Um, so it's not some mission requirement thing. It is simply it was time to bring a new booster into the active Falcon 9 fleet, and it just so happened that it will make its debut on the CRS mission. Um, this booster may very well fly other CRS missions going forward uh, after it is recovered and being reused. So not a mission requirement or anything, just, have, just time to debut a new booster. Makes the Dragon sense. spacecraft on this mission is not brand new, however, this this is the same cargo dragon that supported the CRS-22 mission, so it is a reused Dragon capsule. Yeah, it is Dragon, what is it, C-209-2. That's the one. No fancy Very names cool. on the uh, cargo dragon spacecraft, we just refer to them by their serial numbers. It would kind of be nice if they named them... Uh, sort of in a more frivolous fashion, you know, the car, the crew dragons sort of have uh, very, uh, I don't know how else to put it, really like, not really fancy, but sort of honorable or serious names. Yeah. Um, befitting of, you know, their, the serious nature of launching humans into orbit. But launching these cargo missions, it'd be cool if Cargo Dragon had a name like, we're going to call this one, uh, I don't know, Gumdrop. I, I've made that joke before, but <laughs> yeah. I'll, make, I'll make it again. It's a capsule. Let's see, some questions. Prasad is asking, is this the quickest three consecutive SpaceX launches? I believe it probably is. I do know that the previous two and the, the sort of three launches in three days that SpaceX is going for right now, the previous two did break the turnaround record between two launches uh, from 44 hours, which was between the Starlink Group 2 one mission and the Inspiration 4 mission. And then that record was broken when they went with Starlink Group 44 from Vandenberg and the, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the launch, Turksat, geez, Turksat 5B, that was down to just over 15 hours between those two launches. Um, so that was the quickest turnaround between two launches. And then I do believe adding Cirrus 24 again, assuming that the launch happens on this attempt, which weather is not currently the best so they're looking for a gap to try and get it off this morning um, they also have another attempt about 24 hours from now which would probably be the quickest for three launches within you know four days that is also i believe a record um I, we can work on getting that super verified for you i'll get back to you but um it is definitely a th three launches in really quick succession I scoffed a little bit when you said super verified because I immediately imagined like a red check mark on Twitter, <laughs> which John Krause will extra never get. Um, <laughs> let's see. Sorry, John. We all love you. Uh, no. Chris is asking, how's the weather looking? Is it go? Is it no go? Like currently, do we know if there if we are red for weather or what the situation is in that respect? I know it doesn't look great, but uh, strictly technically speaking, do we know if we're currently in violation or, or what? The last we heard was that the weather was observed red, but of course that doesn't really matter 43 minutes ahead of launch because this is Florida. So the main criteria they're going to look at when they decide with the go no go poll here shortly is whether or not the weather, whether the weather, that there's a better way to say that I think, um, if that weather is trending towards a go condition at the T0 mark. If it is trending the wrong direction and is already observed red, um, that's going to be a strong argument for not going into the countdown here. Although it is also an instantaneous window. Um, if there was a, you know, a one hour, two hour launch window, what they would do is, all right, the weather is red and trending the wrong direction. So let's not target the opening of the window. Let's hold off on fueling and see if it can improve over the course of the window. But since it's an instantaneous window, they might say, we understand it's trending the wrong direction. This is definitely looking like the weather will not be good. But we can still enter the countdown because doing so doesn't change the odds of launching today since there's only one moment in time that we can launch today anyway. And we'll simply see how the weather goes during the fueling countdown, as long as the weather is not in violation of any rules that prohibit fueling to begin with, which uh, usually fueling is okay. Um, it's the flight rules that you're really worrying about. 
Um, and then once we get closer to the actual T0 mark, they can make a decision as late as, you know, a minute before launch, um, whether or not to actually proceed with the flight. And that gives you the whole fueling timeline for the weather to improve and give it a chance at least. The weather okay. forecast is better for the 24 hour delay. Um, the T0, if they were to push to tomorrow would be 4.43 a.m. Eastern Time or 9.43 UTC, and that has a 70% chance of favorable conditions. So the forecast does improve, um, but right now they have not yet given up on giving it a shot this morning. So do you think that they would uh, pull go for fueling just to try and find a hole in the weather and sort of punch through it if they get the opportunity? Or do you think, um, you know, if it's just looking bad enough that they would just say, let's not even fuel it, let's get some rest and try again tomorrow. If it is looking bad enough, they can do that. However, the fact that they haven't done that yet is a sign that they intend to at least give it a shot. Uh, but again, that actual go no-go poll is coming up in about two minutes, and uh, we should receive some official word whether or not they are going to fuel Falcon 9 and make an attempt here. Sure enough, coming up on that, so we will... Keep our ears open and we'll let you know as there are any developments whatsoever. Let's go on to some more questions, shall we? Sure. Julia, is this uh, is this booster, it's not going to do an RTLS, right? It's going to land on a, on a drone ship out at sea? You are right. It's going to land on a drone ship out at sea. Uh, that drone ship is, just read the instructions, and the multi-purpose ship that is with that drone ship is Doug. And of course, there are no fairings with a CRS mission, so it is just a drone ship and uh, another ship out there. My question to you guys is, what were we trending for landing zone weather, with this being a first-time booster? I believe the stage one recovery weather was listed as a low risk. That was not a major concern for today's launch. Okay, because we all know that if it's a first-time flown booster, and if the weather mm -hmm. were bad out there, that would be a good reason not to launch as well. Yeah, Here I do not. I have not seen any concerns about booster recovery moderate for this on the forecast. Oh, never mind, Michael. It is moderate risk, so not high risk, but it's not low risk either. So, and um, okay. if it were to be a scrub tomorrow, is seventy percent go for launch, but the booster recovery is high risk. Yeah, good to and know. that's. That was my fear. All of the rain that we are experiencing here eventually will push offshore, making mm -hmm. uh, recovery weather more difficult. And that is another reason why we are likely going to see at least an attempt today, because if the weather uh, is improving drastically, like the next attempt or whatever, they are much more likely to say, let's just wait a day and give it an attempt. But if weather is trending badly for future launch windows, then that gives you a reason to say, okay, we should at least give it a shot today because if it works out for this launch attempt, then we don't have to worry about the even worse forecast, or at least in some respects, uh, on the backup opportunities. So, It's interesting, though, because even if they do launch it today and get the good landing weather, weather or the better landing weather than tomorrow, they're still going to be out at sea tomorrow as they head back into port, which that's always fun and interesting. Um, here is a relevant question to the topic at hand. Uh, how dependent is the is the decision to launch on the booster landing? Like, would they scrub the launch if uh, landing weather was bad enough? They absolutely yeah. would and have, right, Julia? That's correct. They have. I can't recall the exact mission, but actually more than once, and they tend to be winter missions like this, they, they have said, no, nope, you know what, it's too risky for landing. Um, so that was a sign that reuse became very important to SpaceX. And it's also a sign, I mean, for the customer, like if the NASA could, you know, and I don't know if they have these kind of conversations, but hypothetically, NASA could go to SpaceX and say, look, this mission is super important. We don't want to delay it for booster recovery. And SpaceX could say, okay, here's the deal. If we have a, you know, if all the launch weather is green, but the booster recovery weather is red and we say that's no go, you can tell us to launch anyway, but you're now paying for an expendable launch and not a recoverable launch. Um, that, could, in theory, could be a negotiation. Um, I have no idea if that's something that they do or if NASA says the booster landing weather is a normal launch criteria. That is more likely given that it is a direct effect on how much the customer has to pay for this mission. 
That makes sense. That would, that would be an interesting conversation to be at the table at. We did just get a little poof of uh, vapor from I the first that. stage there. So it's like it was saying hello to us. Hello, first stage. <laughs> and a little bit more. We, I, I mean, dare I say, does it, does it look like we're starting to get into fueling here? I, I have the countdown net in my ear. They have not called out the result of the poll yet. No. Yeah. I think what we're seeing oh, wait, hold is on. the system. Standing by. There we go for prop load. All right. So the SpaceX teams have given a go for prop load, which is why we're starting to see the GSE come to life here. Again, the actual fueling begins at exactly T minus 35 minutes. So we're just under a minute from them actually starting to pump fuel in. But they have given a go for propellant load, so we're going to give it a shot this morning. NASA Spaceflight in chat, I assume Chris Bergen says, so you're telling me there's a chance. Which is... <laughs> yes, yes, sir. There is a chance. I love it. It's a Dumb and Dumber reference for those of y'all that don't know. Go watch Dumb and Dumber. Um, let's see. Some super chats really quick before we get too far behind. Graham, thank you so much for the support. They say, do you have any news on the vertical integration facility they have to build there for DOD launches? I believe they are going to build it still. It is not started yet, but should be started soon. I think that's about where we're at, right? Yeah, I don't believe those missions are super imminent, like the actual launch, so that infrastructure won't be needed super, super soon. But I have a fair chance that over the next year, there will, we will start to see that uh, infrastructure start to show up at 39A. Yeah, that would make sense. And given that they are also going to be building the Starship pad at 39A, mm -hmm. I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked to see sort of both of those things grow up together yeah also uh, worth noting just to keep again weather is going to be the big talking item for this countdown SpaceX also usually points out what they're looking at with regards to weather when they're doing like their tweets and things and their tweet that they just went out specify that they're looking at weather conditions at the launch site so even though that booster recovery risk was moderate it sounds like that's not really the watch item for this countdown and they're much more looking at uh, normal flight restrictions above 39a Okay, well, you know what? That that gives me hope because I really don't want to do this again tomorrow as much as I love <laughs> our team and our followers. Um, and These 4 a.m. Nice launches are pretty much the worst launch time, aren't they? Yeah, yeah and it's a 4 a.m. launch pre-holiday, which always makes it even mm. more tricky. I think the SpaceX teams would also like to wrap up their 2021 launch campaign and uh, be ready to stand down for the holidays and come back for January. I hope once they do, they get to have a nice big SpaceX-style holiday party. Yeah. Michelle Pierce, thank you for the support. They say morning, guys. Good morning. And Seats, I'm probably butchering your name. I sincerely apologize, but welcome to being a Capcom member. If you guys don't know, we have a membership program here on YouTube. You get various perks for various levels of support. Capcom level gets you access to the Discord. So pop on into the Discord there. Seats, tell me how I'm mispronouncing your name. <laughs> and sure enough, I will greet you with my requisite obligatory Forrest Gump gif that I like <laughs> to greet all of our members with. Uh, but seriously, thank you for the support to you for being a new member and to all of our members. That sort of uh, monthly recurring support for our channel is huge to enabling what we do, and we appreciate it so much. And don't forget, you don't have to support us monetarily, though we sincerely appreciate everybody that does. The Super Chats, the, the membership program members, we really appreciate that. But you can, you can support us just by hitting that little like button down there or hitting subscribe if you haven't. Or even just telling your friends, hey, you're into that, that rocket stuff just like me, huh? Because we're friends. <laughs> Check out NASA Spaceflight. But I suspect if you have friends that are into rockets, they already know about us. But if they don't, you can always just give us a mention. Point being... Thank you for the support in whatever form you are able to provide. It doesn't have to be monetary. I have um, a question for the folks in the field really quick. Julia, the, we are looking at, of course, the live view from Steven's camera of 39A, and we're not even seeing the lightning mast on top of the crew tower. Is that a factor of, like, haze or fog, or is that how low the cloud ceiling is? Um, well, I, I think that's how low the cloud ceiling is, to be honest. Um, cause Sheesh. I don't see it on my camera either. 
No, it's not on my, well, it's barely on my camera, so that is a cloud ceiling. Yeah, I, we might be able to make out, you know, just the very base of it. It's kind of fading in and out because the, the, the weather conditions are, you can, it's very easy to see why they are not exactly the most favorable for launch right now. And no. fun fact, are. that is no fun for a photographer because focusing right. on something that is so hazy is, uh, let's say I'm not going to promise spectacular pictures today. You know what you know we got to do, Julia. You have to call it abstract or artsy. Right. Those are the those are the weasel words that photographers. I love like to... abstract art. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Get a little CIA sponsored uh, abstract art going. If, if anyone knows what I'm talking about. Anyways, thank you, Isaac Chapman, for becoming a Red Team member. Red Team. We're talking about members a little bit, talking about perks and stuff. Red Team members get preview videos that go live before the daily videos do. They get photos from Nick and Mary out in the field. They get uh, community posts, and they get the members emoji, which is always fun because you can do things like what I'm about to do, which is throw an Elon super heavy into chat. That is five <laughs> Elons in a row. That's a, that's an Elon common booster core with two <laughs> side booster Elons on either side. That's a, that's a very, that's a extremely high payload emoji there. So, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, thank you so much, Isaac Chapman for the support there. And uh, we hope the members, we hope you enjoy the emoji. We've been adding some more. We're going to continue to add more. It's just one of those things we like to do to uh, make our make our streams a little bit more fun. We're just over thirty seconds or thirty seconds. My brain, thirty minutes <laughs> away from launch. We can see the Falcon Nine first stage getting fueled up, and we are answering your questions. So don't forget if, if you have a question, at NASA Spaceflight in chat, and we will be able to see your question and potentially answer it. Mr. Bonkers, <laughs> I like your name. Nice name. They, yeah, right. Uh, sometimes I feel like Mr. Bonkers. <laughs> they say, thanks for the stream as usual, guys. Always great seeing another one. Is this the last flight for SpaceX this year? Yes, it is. There is. Caesar, this will thank be you. Go for, their, go for it. I was going to say, this will be their 31st orbital launch of the year, and uh, that is a couple launches beyond the record. They've already broken the record, but they are setting a new record for most orbital launches in a given year with 31, counting CRS-24. They're just, they're smashing the record. They see that record, they throw it on the ground. They have a new record. Um, Caesar, thank you for the support. They say, I truly hope in my lifetime I get to see Starship supplying the ISS, Moon Station, and Mars. I'm 51, by the way. I think you're in good shape, buddy. Although, I don't know if we'll ever see Starship actually supply the ISS, but maybe, just maybe, we'll see Starship supplant the ISS. That would be excellent. As much as I love the ISS, it's not going to last forever. And last up here in the uh, supporter column for now, Sausage. Both a delicious food and a new Capcom member. So <laughs> thank you so much, Sausage, for the support. Again, you get Discord access. So pop into Discord, say hey, and I will greet you with my requisite Forrest Gump waving gif. Let's see. We have a question from our... our Archer, Archeronis, I'm probably butchering that, I apologize, saying, could SpaceX use a modified version of the second stage to test the Raptor vacuum engine, obviously modified for Methalox? That was in the cards at one point, right? But, uh, yeah. but they have they have mixed that in favor of full-up testing, right? Yeah, so basically, there. I mean, there's been a couple of different versions of that concept. There was, at one point, an idea to literally take a Falcon 9 upper stage and resize the tanks within it so that it would be the methalox kind of ratio between fuel and oxidizer. Fuel it with methalox and use a Raptor vacuum engine that was proposed at one point. It would be a higher energy upper stage than the actual Falcon 9 Carolox engines, uh, the Merlin vacuum engine, of course, but um, that ended up not coming to fruition. There was also that plan for like a mini starship that was falcon 9 diameter and you would like replace the upper stage with a mini starship as a way to test the aero design on a smaller scale that also didn't happen but there, there it was proposed at one point as a test um uh, platform that's the word i'm looking for um, however they have gone with the more we could just stick them on those grain silo looking things in texas and test them that way so that appears to be good enough for their purposes. Remember, they fired Raptor Vacuum uh, during the most recent Starship 20 static fires, so 
they are testing them uh, in that scenario instead. Let's see, what else do we have here? Is this launch going to, you know, provided B-1069 lands, is this going to be the 100th landing, or are we not there yet? This is the, yeah. I'm sorry, the question is, is this the 100th landing? It is, right? Yes, it is the 100th landing, if it lands today. Quite a momentous achievement. Hopefully and, uh, we get kind of we a. Get... Yeah, kind of a weird, you know, nerdy stat as well. They just, re on their most recent landing, the 99th landing, they improved their landing success rate to 90%, which I don't believe it has ever been that high. Um, so they are also at, you know, higher success rates than ever before. And that's including every single landing attempt they've ever done. Obviously, if you were to narrow it down to block five, for example, um, that would improve their success rate. But overall... They are their landing reliability is higher than it has ever been since Falcon Nines began trying to land in the first place. It really is. It's it's nothing fancy anymore. Even though it's crazy fancy and amazing and astounding that it can even be done. Even though we're at the hundredth one, just about. It's still wild. Uh, and and yet, people seem kind of used to it. People sort of seem to expect it. And in the event there's going to be an expendable launch or especially an expendable Falcon Nine, it's sort of outside the norm and that sort of thing is awesome because not long ago people were speculating that landing boosters wasn't even going to be cost effective or wasn't even going to be possible if you go back far enough you know five six years ago oh. let's see Shalene says i'm so bummed that i'm actually vacationing here in florida and i'm not going to be able to see the launch live but thanks for the coverage Sorry, Shailene. I, I'm one, sorry for probably butchering your name, and two, I'm sorry you're not going to be able to see it live, but here's the thing. It used to be that when you missed a launch, it was going to be quite a while before you got a chance to see another one. And in this day and age, SpaceX is yeeting rockets left and right. So, you sh if not SpaceX, another launch provider, you should have plenty of chances in the future. I know maybe, um, just going on context here, uh, on your statement in Super Chat here, you don't seem to live in Florida, but that's okay. There's also Wallops, and that's okay. There's also Vandenberg. So plenty of opportunities for you to hopefully get to a launch site and see a launch. I'm sorry you won't be seeing this one tonight. But the good thing is, is you have our stream. You get to hang out with us and be nerds and talk about things like oven bacon and cheesecake being a pie and not a cake. <laughs> Let's see. Siddhartha is asking, why don't they have an abort system on Cargo Dragon just to save the cargo and reuse the spacecraft? I'm reminded of CRS, what was it, 7? Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, Falcon 9 had an, an, an anomaly. Uh, the second stage kind of went pop. The first stage sort of powered through the cloud of debris, and the Dragon capsule was sending telemetry all the way to the water. Uh, and I believe there was somebody furiously trying to get the shoots to pop <laughs> on a There's console. Someone mashing somewhere. space bar because like just yeah. terrible, you know. <laughs> I love it. Oh man! And then, but, oops! Uh, I hit it too many times. I've accidentally staged something else. Right. The, there is on the more serious note, though, they have actually in, after that when they realized, oh, a dragon capsule might not necessarily explode if the rocket below it explodes. Even though, of course, the, there's no abort system in the sense that they removed the Super Dragos simply because those are there for crew safety and the fact is they're not cheap to produce. I mean, they, they're not prohibitively expensive, but it doesn't make cost-effective sense to make install them on non-crew rated spacecraft. So um, the Dragon doesn't have an abort system in that sense. However, they have since programmed all cargo Dragons to be able to still detect its descent from an anomalous ascent, anomalous ascent, and if it's coming down and everything is still healthy, it will deploy the chutes and splash down, um, which they have shown from CRS-7, which of course they don't plan to test this at any point, but they unfortunately had the opportunity to learn that on that flight, um, that yeah, they, they can in fact attempt to recover a dragon if there's a launch anomaly, so... There is an abort system. There's an abort contingency uh, in, in the sense. Always good to have contingency plans. And you can see just a second ago, 
Stephen had zoomed out to show us that it appears the cloud ceiling has lifted a little bit. So you want to know why that is? Wh why is that, Julia? Please tell. Oh, because um, Florida just got a little chillier. So as far as ground, like ground winds go, it's just a little breezier right now, which actually brought in some cooler air with it. Well, there you go. Look how clean that booster is. I must say that even though, you know, we're getting very used to the reused booster look, and I think it looks very cool, a clean Falcon 9 looks, it, it's, it's that, SpaceX, that SpaceX aesthetic that's like brand new and futuristic, a very clean looking Falcon 9 stack uh, does look very, very nice. It's a, it's a very pretty rocket. I definitely do not uh, disagree with that statement. Uh, clean Falcon 9 is a sight to behold. It's really beautiful. It's it's particularly beautiful. Yeah, I will say, Jack, though, I was just going to say, hey, Jack, can you describe to me what an 11 time flown booster looks like? That's You knew exactly where I was going. Um, but before I wax philosophic on that, Thomas, what were you going to say about the capsule we're looking at right now? Right, yeah, I was saying we're looking at the capsule now, and even though that capsule has been reused, this is the second flight for this dragon. The capsules don't, they, they get cleaned up pretty well. Uh, between flights because when you see a dragon come back from orbit it it, it becomes pitch black after a single flight because of re-entry uh, but they do touch up and, and repaint it and things like that so um, that's a bit different also so we don't get fired we do have to point out the t-minus 20 minute vent of course which is the sign that they have finished a liquid oxygen loading into the stage two in the upper stage and they are purging the ground support line so that they can start loading rp1 kerosene um, so that is a good milestone in the countdown that that is proceeding nominally. This is a very interesting T minus 20 minute event. I don't know if it's the wind direction or what, but it, it sort of just looks like a massive amount of venting coming from the, uh, the strong back itself versus from yep. like a single point on Falcon nine. But yep, this is a nominal situation. This is what we want to see that and know that the fueling process is continuing as expected. And the T minus 20 minute event is uh, what we're currently looking at there. So, back to a new booster. It's, it's, it's interesting to me, because today, just this morning, I was down in the port of LA shooting uh, the return of B-1051, and 1051.11, as a matter of fact. It's flown 11 times. It's the, it's the life leader of the fleet currently, and thus is also the dirtiest booster. And... It was basically black. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it was pretty much pitch black, and it was quite a sight. I've seen plenty of reused boosters. I've seen plenty of boosters come back into port uh, bo on both coasts, but I've never quite seen a, bo a booster as sooty as B-1051, and that was really exceptional, especially now looking at a brand new booster, B-1069, on the pad here at 39A. It's... It's quite a contrast, and I, what I was going to say, Thomas, is I agree with you that a new a new booster looks delightful and so cool and futury and all of those things. But to me, a used rocket is sort of like seeing an empty launch pad after T zero. It's what you want to see. You want to see a rocket that has been used over and over and over again because. That's the future that we all want to live in. And so to see a sooty booster, to me, is like seeing the Millennium Falcon all banged up and dinged. It's like a real spacecraft that's been used. Or seeing a shuttle. If you ever get the chance to see a shuttle on display, you notice immediately, holy cow, these things took a beating. I mean, you can, you can see on each tile, there's like little scuffs and scars yeah. and micrometeoroid impacts. And it's just like, wow, this thing has been used. And as cool and beautiful as a brand new Falcon 9 looks, the used ones sort of have an air of, uh, I don't even, I'm, I'm running out of words, but you get it. I like the way the used ones look, TLDR. Right. Although I do have to, I don't want to be that guy, Jack, but it is Dash 11, not Dot 11. Is it Dash? Okay, thank you. I, I can never <laughs> remember if it's Dash or Dot. And so, no, I appreciate you being that guy. I can be that guy. <laughs> All the time, so you feel free to be that guy to me whenever you please. 
We're just under 17 minutes now, and that uh, that 20 minute vent is going to be wrapping up here because the actual fueling process for RP1 kerosene into stage two does begin at T minus 16 minutes. Uh, liquid oxygen loading would be done by this point, and the RP1 and LOX load into the first stage is ongoing simultaneously. So, fueling proceeding nominally at this time. We have a question here. Actually, it's more of a statement. Matt is saying. SpaceX is like the Constellation program, cargo and crew to the ISS, HLS for lunar landings, and human missions to Mars. Wait. Wait. Does that mean Falcon <laughs> 9 is really the Ares one? If you start talking about docking Dragon to HLS instead of using Orion, then yeah, you can make an argument. I just, I just had to do that one for you, Thomas. That was just for you. I, I greatly appreciate it, Jack. I've been saying for a while that Ares 1 Orion was basically a commercial crew vehicle. Anyway, I'll stop. <laughs> oh, man. Let's see. Wheelie98, thank you for the support. They're asking, have there been more reflights than first flights? I think by nature there has to have been, right? I mean, absolutely. There's only been two missions, two SpaceX missions flown on brand new boosters this year, and there was 31 orbital flights. So do the math. Way more reflights than first flights. And that's what we want to be seeing. We want to be seeing rapid reuse. Also, if you don't have to build a new rocket every time. Things get cheaper. It just makes sense. Right. The only thing they have to build for each flight is a new second stage. That's the manufacturing constraint. But. Um, the the other question, and I'm purely asking because off the top of my head, I do not actually know the answer. Were there any intentionally expendable flights this year? Oh. That Someone in chat, good tell good. me. I'm, there probably no. was that I'm forgetting. But no. Michael says no. So that is another noteworthy milestone. Were there any landing failures this year? One. Were there, there was one landing failure this year. So... If they go for 30, this is they've done 30 orbital flights this year, 29 of which included booster recoveries, and the one that didn't was a, a landing failure, not because they didn't try at all. So that is another sign, and I think that's even the more important thing, because obviously you will eventually need to debut new boosters just to bolster the fleet a bit, and if you have a landing failure, you want to replace that booster. If you are increasing your flight cadence, you will need more boosters to support that. But... The fact that they did not attempt any flights with the intention of expending a booster is a very is something that's even more notable in my opinion. Weather yeah. is now green. And yeah, I was just about to bring in. We have a report that weather is now observed green at T minus fourteen minutes and counting. So we might be getting lucky, folks. This is why they went into fueling because they wanted to give it a shot, and looks like it might just work out. Of course. The weather right now doesn't matter as much as the weather in 13 minutes, so we'll see. I've got something I've got to say. Space nerds getting lucky. How fun is that? <laughs> I mean, and that's why you try and you don't just give up and say, meh. Because especially if the weather is trending positive, if mm. it's red, but you know in a little bit it's going to be a little bit less red, then you can extrapolate. Hey, maybe it'll be green by the time we hit T0. And here we are with just over 13 minutes to go. And it... I mean, just looking at things, thank you, Stephen, for the zoomed out view there. Just looking at things, it's visibly less horrible yeah, out absolutely. there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, man. Jerry, like we say, Florida weather, if you don't like it, wait five minutes. Sure enough. I mean, I remember growing up there, and it would be like, oh, it's 3.30, time for the 30-minute torrential downpour. <laughs> and it would be like all heck had broken loose for about 30 minutes, and then it would be fine. And that was, like, every day all summer. Um, Jerwa, thank you for the support. They say, almost forgot to click the thumbs up button. Phew! Anyone else forget? Well, thank you, Jerwa, <laughs> for hitting that thumbs up button. We really appreciate that. And the support for the channel. One of those names that's always popping up. Regular around here for a long time now. We really like that thumbs up button, you know? Yeah, you know, it helps the algorithm know that people like what we do and like our videos and... Uh, I mean, come on. Everybody knows it. It's 2021. We're all ruled by the algorithms. So tell the algorithm you like us, please. And thank you. Ashley Rigo is asking, what has been the quickest turnaround of a Falcon 9 pad? 
of a single pad? Oh, I would have to do some research into that. I do not know off the top of my head. I also do not know off the top of my head, but I am sitting here looking at chat, eagerly awaiting someone smarter than me to tell me. So if I see that, I will blurt it out like I am wont to do. Uh, Jorg is asking, we were talking about 1051 a second ago. I hate to be that guy, but isn't B1051-12-12 since the designation changes on recovery? See, I've heard different things about that. I've heard that the designation changes upon recovery, and it becomes dash 12 once it lands. And I've also heard that it becomes dash 12 not once it lands, but once it is assigned another mission. So uh, I don't... Uh, I, I believe... Did. Yeah, go ahead, Julia. I was going to say... I think you're going to say the same thing as me, but the moment it lands is actually the moment it becomes a new number. And that is so that they can put it in the logistics system and start assigning its next mission, where it's going to um, be parked, shall we say, what coast is it going to for that matter, and what um, may need to be refurbished so that they can get all the bits and pieces ready for the next flight as it's coming back. That makes sense. Thanks. I see it. I've... I've heard both things, and I never know which one to uh, to accept as canon. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Ben Parr, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. I'll tell you what I've told our other two new Capcom members from the stream. Pop into the Discord, because you get Discord access, and I will gleefully send you a uh, Forrest Gump wave gif here. So I'm actually going to do that now for someone else. But seriously, thank you so much to Ben for becoming a new member and thank you to all of our members because once again what we do is not cheap it takes time, human hours it also takes data right now Steven is broadcasting via cellular data and uh, it's it's well, suffice to say not cheap <laughs> so we really appreciate the support thank you so much and here we go I'm going to hit enter on this gif this is just a, a, fee, a stream of me talking about what I'm doing on Discord. Uh, <laughs> don't you love it? But seriously, thank you. And JR, thank you for the support. They say, morning crew, enjoy some coffee, and is the jellyfish possible for tonight's launch attempt since the sun comes up earlier now? I don't think so, but... Yeah, I'm, too early, that. unfortunately. We People might always... get... I mean, if the cloud ceiling wasn't so low, you might be able to catch a glimpse like near the end of stage 2 flight, like just a little bit, but not a full jellyfish effect. And this is exasperated by the fact that there are clouds in the way, so even less of a, even less likely. You know what happened the other day uh, for Starlink out of Vandenberg? People were asking if it was going to do the jellyfish. I was asking if it was going to do the jellyfish. Sure enough, it did not. However, I guess the the plume, the exhaust plume, stuck around, mm. and a friend of mine who had to get up very early that morning. Um, around 6 a.m., right around sunrise, said that they woke up and went outside and looked, and the plume was illuminated by the sun. And so they got a little bit of a, of a show in that respect. And I was like, darn it, I could have been awake for that, but I wasn't. <laughs> so even though today might not be jellyfish material, maybe the conditions will be right that stuff will look cool at sunrise. You never know. But it's always worth asking about the jellyfish because it's such an awesome phenomenon, and it is rare. So it's it's worth underscoring that. We're just about eight and a half minutes away from launch, and I am getting excited. Weather is green. Falcon 9 is continuing to be fueled up. They're in second stage fueling right now, right, Thomas? Uh, correct. Uh, well, both stages. The first stage obviously takes longer to fill because, well, it's bigger. So they, f they fuel the two different propellants in the stage two separately, while the first stage fuels both simultaneously. Um, and so both stages are still being filled uh, with their various commodities at this time. Looks like Steven is giving us another view of the weather here. It's this like a gonna... bat signal out there. <laughs> it is. Have I, I don't think I've ever posted these photos. Maybe I did and I forgot. There was a time I was out at Starbase, and it was a low cloud ceiling just like this, and the, the pad lights on Starship basically made a giant Starship bat signal in the clouds. It was quite surreal. I think that was with for SN8. You gotta love when that sort of thing happens. Agustin? 
Sab... Spazzo? Sabzo? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you for becoming a Red Team member, though. And I'm sorry for butchering your name. I, I really do apologize. Um, let's see. Here's a... I don't, I don't even... This is a really meta-philosophical question, but I feel like asking it. <laughs> Nick is asking... When do these launches become so routine that you stop live coverage? I say never. Never. Yeah, we'll just set up a 24-7 camera feed, and, you know, you'll always just be able to tune in whenever they're happening. Yeah, I mean, if you ask me, we are, like, the 24-hour Rocket News Network, and if there's a launch, we should be covering it. So, ideally, that would be the case. There is no such thing as routine. It's rocket science. Is, is brain surgery routine, sir? <laughs> Lots of brain well, surgeries mean, occur, but it's definitely not routine. No. And, and I mean, there are people who will tune into the 24-7 cam at Starbase just to follow tanks around, right? Right. Follow different bits of hardware. So we definitely would want to always share the rumble of a launch. Sure enough. And shout out to Starbase Live. If you guys don't know, it's a 24-hour live stream that we have going on this very channel of Starbase with multiple cameras, multiple angles, Sometimes when I can't decide what to put on, you know, like, oh, Netflix has removed all the movies and good shows that I love so well. What am I going to watch? It's nice to just put on Starbase Live. It's an easy it's an easy choice. And it's often fascinating, whatever's going on. Mary or Nick coming, going out there and spooling up from various roadside locations or some of our robotic cameras doing their thing. So if you don't know about Starbase Live, now you do. Go check it out when you get a chance. Something tells me at the end of this stream, we'll do a thing that'll throw you over there so you can check it out even if uh, you forget what I'm telling you right now. But definitely, Starbase Live is, is is useful, and it's sort of like, at what point does Starbase Live become routine? I don't think so. I just I don't think we're at that point. I think we would want to be, philosophically, but we're a ways away. And speaking of a ways away, we are not that far away from launch. We're just over five minutes away. Falcon 9, very con condensate -y. Is that, that's that's a word, right? Con condensation. You covered. know it is now, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so things are looking good. Weather is green. We're all very happy about this thing. Hopefully, getting off the pad tonight. So let's keep going with a couple more questions as we get closer to launch, and then we will, of course, shut up at launch and allow you guys to hear the rumble of Falcon 9's first stage engines muscling crew drag. Oh, Cargo Dragon off the pad. I can talk. I swear I can talk. Let's see. Khalid is asking if there's a backup opportunity. There is one tomorrow, but we're not going to worry about that. We're going to hope it goes tonight. Absolutely. Let's see. Octavian, thank you for the support. They say, yo, dog, I heard you like towers, so I put a tower on top of the tower. I believe they're talking about the lightning arrester up there. Yeah. And Alex, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. Again, you get the you get the uh, members-only emo emojis. I almost called them emojis. What's wrong with me? You also get preview videos and photos from Mary and Nick. A bunch of cool stuff for members there, so thank you for becoming a new member, and we hope you enjoy the perks. Wow, that's a clean Falcon 9. Yeah. And normally, I mean, when you get a, even the reused ones, when they start to get fueled up and they get a little bit frosty on the outside, it starts to look more like it did when it was clean because it becomes white again. But this is a very clean and, and bright white uh, since there's no soot yet. No scorch. Hashtag no scorch. Yet. <laughs> Stephanie is asking, how long does the Dragon Cargo take to get to the ISS? Uh, depends on the launch, but this particular flight, we're expecting a docking tomorrow on the 22nd. Um, let me see if I can get a docking time for you, actually. One second. Uh, doo -doo. Uh oh. It's. Uh oh, the information is not where I thought it was. Hold on. I will get back to you on an actual time real quick, but um, it will be tomorrow. Uh, and that's usually, it's about a 24-hour trip to the station. Um, and then once it's there, it will spend about a month docked to the International Space Station. Let's 
Let's see. Looking for some more questions. Again, and, this uh, is Falcon 9 B1069. It is launching on its first launch tonight. Launching a Cargo Dragon on its second launch tonight. From yes, Pad 39 And the docking time is 4.30 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. So just about 24 hours. But yeah, coming up on 90 seconds to launch here. Godspeed to Steven with the launch tracking. And uh, we are hoping for a liftoff here in just about 80 seconds now. Again, the weather has gone to green. So weather is favorable for launch at this time. Falcon 9 finishing up the fueling process right now. And uh, standing by for the liftoff of Falcon 9 and the CRS-24 mission to the International Space Station. Everything is go right now. And a minute to go. Alex Verland, thank you for becoming a pad rat. And Dusty Dave, thanks for becoming a pad rat. Thank you to all of our new members and thank you to our current members. We super appreciate it. You can see Steven getting the camera set for launch there. Coming up now on T minus 30 seconds, Falcon 9's onboard computers handling the last minute of the countdown. The stage one and stage two tanks are pressurized. And the nine Merlin 1D engines are in, have been in chill down for several minutes now, prepared for liftoff. Coming up on 15 seconds and counting. 10 seconds. There is stage one ignition and liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket and cargo dragon on the CRS-24 mission to the International Space Station. Vehicle has cleared the tower. Plus 70 seconds and what an absolutely gorgeous view of the Falcon 9 disappearing through the clouds first and then onboard views as it punches through the clouds above Cape Canaveral. Vehicle is throttled down for maximum aerodynamic pressure and the flight is going well so far. Seeing it punch through those successive cloud layers was really something. That was quite beautiful. That was awesome. I don't remember seeing that before. That is a very cool kind of visual there. Uh, I'm sound? not even going to lie, like the sound was pretty cool, more muffled than usual. My favorite picture on my camera roll right now is after it got in the cloud deck and everything is orange. It was so freaking cool. Nice. Looking forward to seeing that, Julia. Meanwhile, those first stage engines are back throttled up and coming up on Miko here, main engine cutoff, where the nine engines will shut down and the stages will separate so that the second stage can proceed to orbit and the first stage can return and make a landing attempt. I always love seeing the plume expansion in this phase of flight. You can actually see the plume expanding as the rocket ascends into lower pressure air. Now looking in the inner stage there, of course, we're looking on onboard cameras since, well, it's above the clouds from the ground. But you're looking up into the Merlin vacuum engine nozzle from a camera on stage one. Also some graphics from SpaceX showing the trajectory. There is stage separation. And on the right hand side is a camera on stage two showing Merlin vacuum ignition. So a good ignition on the second stage. That second stage is tasked with powering Dragon the rest of the way to orbital velocity, while the first stage is now deploying its grid fins and reorienting for reentry. 
You'll see the telemetry on the bottom of your screen, and the first stage is going to continue ascending because, of course, it has upward momentum since it uh, conducted the initial ascent. So uh, the first stage is still gaining altitude. You can see it just crossed the Kármán line, so the first stage does get to space. Um, but, of course, it does not achieve orbit, and you can see the speed is decreasing because its upward momentum is carrying it upward, but gravity is slowing it down. It will reach some minimum speed where it is only traveling horizontally, and then it will begin to accelerate back down to the ground thanks to gravity. And we'll see that speed start to increase and the altitude decrease as it comes back down and re-enters Earth's atmosphere. Conversely, the second stage will continue gaining altitude and speed as it gets to cuts closer to its initial insertion orbit. We always see that uh, that ring around the MVAC engine right after ignition sort of pops off. Do you know what that is, Thomas? Is that like a tensioner for vibrations, or what's going on there? I know the, the term for it is a stiffener ring. It's a structural element that stiffens the Merlin vacuum engine bell, because you have to remember the main difference between a sea level engine and a vacuum engine is the bell, that shape that you're seeing, you know, glow white hot right now is much larger on a vacuum engine. Basically, you expand the nozzle way more because you want the pressure of the exhaust to be as close to the same as the ambient pressure outside, which in a vacuum is zero. Um, so if you expand the nozzle much wider, the exhaust gases are at a lower pressure, and that gives you your best performance both from a thrust perspective and a specific impulse or fuel efficiency perspective. So because they have that bigger nozzle on there, they need a little stiffener to uh, to help out it survive uh, the stresses of first stage flight and vibration and engine start, second engine startup and all that good stuff. Yep, exactly. Of course, we've seen the upper stage uh, reignite after that first burn when the stiffener ring sheds after that first um, burn. So I believe it is mostly for stage one loads during uh, the initial ascent rather than it needs it for ignition, because we've seen a Merlin vacuum reignite, you know, later in the mission, so. That makes sense. Also a very well done, of course, it was a short-lived track, but a very well done with the exposure settings and the track up through the cloud, Stephen, well done. Appreciate you being out there right and early to give us that camera view of today's launch. Meanwhile, checking back in with the telemetry, you'll see stage one has well in, into its descent, actually coming back down through the various boundaries of space, depending on which one you subscribe to, but uh, coming back down into Earth's atmosphere, and we'll be coming up on the stage one entry burn that is the next milestone, when three of the Merlin engines on that first stage will reignite to slow the stage down and protect it during re-entry. Is that lightning visible, or are those uh, reaction control thrusters? Yeah, I think those are some small RCS thruster firings, Jack. There is the entry burn ignition. First the center engine, and then the two on the side. You can see the exhaust change as those engines light up. And uh, you can see the stage one speed dropping dramatically as the entry burn slows down stage one. This is Booster 1069's first entry burn and first landing attempt. Nice. Stage 2 also performing nominally so far. There is Stage 1 entry burn shutdown, and we will start to see some re-entry effects. Well, never mind, SpaceX cut away from the camera feed. We would have seen some entry effects as the stage started to heat up just a little bit during that re-entry. And uh, those grid fins and the RCS thrusters will all be, there you go, steering love the it. stage towards just read the instructions. I love seeing the those grid fins ablate or whatever the appropriate word is. The sparks coming off of them as it re-enters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful every time. And we're very lucky when these missions we get to see some of that camera view because, of course, the re-entry heating and things can interfere with that camera view. And you can see it's kind of starting to break down now. But uh, we'll hopefully get that camera feed back once it gets closer to the drone ship as well. And looking for a first successful landing for the booster wild how quickly it's scrubbing off speed at 13 kilometers of altitude it was still going like 3,000 kilometers an hour now it is down to just over a thousand kilometers an hour at five kilometers of altitude that's 
that's a rapid deceleration. <laughs> right, and that's not that's with no engines firing. That is purely aerodynamic forces and aerodynamic drag doing work. But we are coming up on the stage one landing burn, which will be the single engine on the center of stage one lighting to conduct the final landing and touchdown. I'll just read the instructions and let's look and listen in. There is that landing burn seen from an onboard view of stage one. Waiting uh, for that shot from the drone ship that shows us the booster has landed. Come on, 1069, come on. Lots of zeros on the stage one telemetry, which is a good sign. Also, stage two has just shut down into its initial orbit, and there hey, is booster come 1069. On, come on, come on. on just <laughs> read the instructions. Bullseye again, as usual. So a successful first launch and landing for that booster, the first of many we hope. Also stage two and dragon are in an initial park an initial orbit. So a successful orbital insertion. And there will be a brief ghost phase before Dragon separates from that upper stage, but all in all a very successful initial ascent here. I, I love it. Right as you said that, SpaceX uh, switched to the, the shot of looking up the trunk and then and then really quickly switched away. Like they were prepping that view, <laughs> but weren't ready to show it yet. But just because you mentioned it, they, they decided to. So that worked out perfectly. Yeah, you got a brief glimpse into some of that cargo uh, in the trunk because there is some unpressurized cargo on this flight. In addition to the pressurized supplies inside the capsule, um, some experiments and things that will be mounted outside the International Space Station. Uh, no solar arrays on this flight, although the next two Cargo Dragon spacecraft, there you go. You can actually see the grappling hook where, grappling it's not a grappling hook, the grappling point that Cannon Arm will grab onto and extract the cargo from the trunk. Um, but uh, the next two Cargo Dragon flights will also bring the next two sets of solar arrays to the International Space Station. Those new rollout solar arrays that are improving the power back. generating Just... capabilities. Back. So sure enough... They landed B-1069, and that is a hundred landings now for the Falcon 9 yep. system. One Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, all of the Falcon boosters combined, it's a hundred landings. That's, quite That's pretty crazy. There are rocket families that have not launched a hundred times, and SpaceX has accomplished a <laughs> hundred landings. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very good point. A lot of people in chat mentioning the the second stage engine stiffener. It's a quark stiffener. It's a ring stiffener. All sorts of people yeah. telling me what kind of stiffener it is. Thank you for that. <laughs> Here's a question. Octavian's asking, what are the green areas on the SpaceX Earth diagram stage two trajectory? You know, know, the graphic looks different than it did it last does. time, doesn't it? It does. I don't think I've seen that before. If I have, I haven't noticed it. It's a very good question. Coming up on Dragon Deploy. Always such a cool shot to see the Dragon capsule and trunk departing from the second stage. Should get that shot any second now. See ya. And there we have it, Dragon Deploy and Cargo Dragon on its second trip to the International Space Station on track for a docking tomorrow at 4.30 a.m. Eastern Time after a successful launch this morning. Look at the limb of the Earth there on the left of the frame. That is positively beautiful. Separating into an orbital sunrise and much to the joy of Dragon Solar Panels. So with that, I think we do have one camera view that we definitely need to take a look at back on the ground because of course, our favorite view after a launch window is an empty launch pad. There we go, Steven with the view. 
of the 39A with no rocket on it anymore because we have had a successful liftoff, SpaceX dodging the weather, SpaceX and NASA dodging the weather cooperatively to get a cargo dragon on orbit and on its way to the International Space Station. I'm honestly kind of flabbergasted they managed to get the rocket in the air tonight given the cruddiness of the weather, but hey, it, it worked out, and that is what we want to see. Dragon on orbit and an empty launch pad. So, sure enough, that brings another NASA spaceflight live stream for a rocket launch to a close. Let's uh, go around the horn again really quick. Julia Bergeron was out there in the field. Julia, thank you for being on comms tonight, sharing your wisdom. Why, thank you for having me. I'm glad I woke up and saw this beautiful sight, and I'll be sharing a picture really soon. Oh, uh, I'm going to look forward to that. And Julia is Julia underscore Bergeron on Twitter, so make sure you follow her. You'll be able to see whatever cool photos she posts from this launch and all other launches. We've also had Stephen Marr out there in the field operating the camera, doing that excellent track and exposure, so we can see a little bit of flame detail there. Thank you, Stephen, for being out there. Uh, again, Space Coast underscore STVE on Twitter. So give Steven a follow as well. Always posting awesome photos of launches and whatnot. And you guys, of course, know Thomas Berghart, News Director for NASA Space Flight, who I've been chatting with tonight as well as Julia. Thomas, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us, Jack, and your commentary as well. No worries. And, of course, in the background, we had Michael Baylor running things. Thank you, Michael, for always being available to run Starship streams and launch streams of any kind. No problem. It's greatly appreciated, and your expertise would be sorely missed had we not have it. With that, I think let's all go hang out in Starbase Live. I'm Jack Beyer, um, whatever you want to call me, video editor, photographer, live stream host, content manager, content producer, post-production supervisor, I don't care. <laughs> all I care about is that you enjoy what we do. And so thank you, everybody, for watching. Let's go hang out in Starbase Live. All right, thanks.